Uh, my name is Councilman Bill Henry. I'm the Councilperson for the 4th District and Chair of the Equity and Structure Committee. Uh, my apologies uh, if my voice is muffled or my face unclear. Um, I did not make it back to my computer in time for this hearing as I had originally hoped, uh, but we're not going to let that stop us. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, call this 10 o'clock hearing of the Equity and Structure Committee to order. Uh, we are joined by Councilman Christopher Burnett of the 8th District, Vice Chair of the Committee, Councilwoman Danielle McRae of the 2nd District, Member of the Committee, and I believe I saw Mr. Stegman of the Mayor's Office uh, representing the administration, and we are also joined by Sam Johnson staff to the committee. Uh, before we start in with Councilman Stokes's resolution, uh, I just wanted to make public uh, notice of the fact that the uh, committee will be sending a final report to President Scott with what is essentially just our opinions and recommendations on those charter amendments that were introduced sent to us as, the, as a committee. We received agency reports, we held public hearings, we had discussions, but there were seven charter amendments that did not receive uh, sufficient support to move out of committee to the floor for a second reader vote. And so what we have done is so as to not waste that effort, we have um, collated our opinions and recommendations on those charter amendments, and we will be submitting those as a report to the president um, for as an end of term report. Um, now, what I would like to do is I would like to turn this hearing over to Councilman Robert Stokes and let him uh, essentially moderate the discussion. Uh, my understanding is that the councilman was not planning on asking for a vote on this, and so the committee would be uh, recessing uh, on this particular piece of legislation, but Councilman Stokes is going to run the conversation around it. Um, and so with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Councilman Stokes. Zero two AR. Recognize systemic racism as a public health crisis. Bringing this bill forward, we are taking the first step to bring about racial equity and justice by recognizing systemic racism as a public health crisis. The city of Baltimore joined over 61 cities, 21, 25 counties, and four states that have made this declaration. The, the counties in the state of Maryland are to date are Anne Arundel County, and Montgomery County. The action we take today must be followed by ways of allocating resources and strategic action to address racism. I'm looking forward to hearing the public's testimony on this matter as we seek to make Baltimore a better place to live for all the citizens while addressing racism for all for those citizens, citizens who face it every day. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my next step would be um, agency reports. Um, Sam, are you here? Yes, sir. Um, I don't have all the agency reports in front of me. Can, can we um, move on uh, the ones that you have and the ones you don't and you let me know also? Yes, sir. Um, first up will be the Department of Transportation, Liam Davis. Liam? Okay. So do we have a written report from transportation, DOT? Yes, sir. Um, they uh, submitted it this morning. Um, next, we'll go to uh, Baltimore City Public Schools. Um, we have Ms. Melissa Broom and Dr. Tracy Durant. Either one of you can go first.
Thanks, Dr. Durant is going to be speaking for city schools this morning. Thank you. Good. Good morning. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Great. Good morning. Uh, Tracy Durant, I'm the Executive Director in the Office of Equity for Baltimore City Schools. Um, we'd like to, to join with the City Council on this resolution to recognize systemic racism as a public health crisis in Baltimore City Schools in June of 2019. Under the direction of our Board of School Commissioners and our CEO, we were able to draft and adopt a equity policy. It is policy ADA. And in that policy, what we say is that we understand that there are systems and structures and practices that have intentionally created um, and continue to afford advantages to some groups while disadvantaging others. We as a district decided to um, make that claim ourselves and we understand that we have to take action to make sure that we are dismantling and disrupting those systems and structures that are situated in institutionalized racism and systemic racism so that we can create new structures to do that. And so we have policy standards as a part of our equity policy that include uh, disrupting and eliminating systemic inequities, honoring culture experiences and humanity of our students, families and communities, ensuring access and representation in academic programming and building staff capacity for equity-based teaching and leading. We have started a series of racial equity seminars that are going to be required at all levels of the organiza organization so that we can have a critical mass of individuals who are equipped with the historical context of race in this country, race in Baltimore, and certainly the impact on city schools over time. We stand with the city council today because as we say in our policy, we do believe that the answers are in Baltimore within our cities and within our city, our schools, communities, and families. We're happy to support this resolution. Thank you. Uh, does Ms. Broom have anything to say from school systems before we move on to the next agency? Um, nope, Dr. Durant covered it for us. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next is um, Stephanie Murdoch on from Housing and Community Development. Hi, thank you. Good morning. Stephanie Murdoch, Legislative Liaison from the Department of Housing and Community Development. We stand by our report in support of this resolution. DHCD supports the intent of this resolution and is committed to overcoming the systemic barriers that have prevented equitable community development for all of Baltimoreans. Mm -hmm. Equity in housing and community development must begin with acknowledgement that the history of slavery and systemic racism is undeniably woven into the fabric of present conditions. Our acting commissioner, Alice Kennedy, is committed to bringing a heightened emphasis to the intersection of health and housing by supporting our legacy homeowners and increasing housing security. These areas are central to a successful equity policy. It is an approach that will increase housing stability, reduce displacement, ignite revitalization, and prevent blight. Uh, the community development framework is the instrument that guides our work, specifically focused on three areas, promoting access and equity by supporting legacy homeowners, promoting affordable housing and maximizing Baltimore's access to jobs and entrepreneurial opportunities. The framework details the following ways in which we work towards access and equity. The department supports legacy and new homeowners by providing weatherization and repair grants and loans, lead paint remediation, and assistance with tax and water bill liens so that owners do not lose their homes over small debts. DHCD, in coordination with the state and other partners, supports estate planning workshops to help seniors plan for transferring ownership of their homes to build intergenerational wealth. DHCD also supports new homeowners by providing homeownership counseling through CDBG grants to local partners and offers down payment assistance grants to eligible buyers through programs such as City Employee Home Ownership Program, Live Near Your Work Program, Buying into Baltimore and Vacants to Value Incentive Programs. 
The department also supports affordable housing, both home ownership and rental. DHCD and HABC are working on many fronts to address the challenges of maintaining and expanding affordable housing. More than 50,000 households, that's 50% of Baltimore's renters, are housing cost burden, meaning they spend more than 30% of their income on housing. Almost a third of all renters in Baltimore live in either a subsidized affordable housing development or have a Section 8 housing choice voucher program. Baltimore has more than 42,000 publicly supported rental units. We are committed to production of affordable private units and a range of programmatic and policy level innovations to decrease the number of Baltimoreans paying more than they can afford. With the recent passage of the PSO TIF, we embark on a unique once in a lifetime opportunity to reverse decades of disinvestment and intergenerational poverty by creating over 2,000 units of mixed income housing, which would include replacement public housing units, units with capped income affordability, and market rate units. Additionally, the department seeks to promote economic inclusion to maximize Baltimoreans' access to jobs and entrepreneurial opportunities. In order to promote equitable redevelopment, it is vital that the residents and local small and minority women-owned businesses have access to the opportunities generated from new investments. Demolition by deconstruction is a great example. Humanum has la launched the successful social enterprise brick and board to sell reclaimed wood brick and architectural remnants, creating green collar jobs for Baltimoreans facing barriers to employment. Finally, on June 4th of this year, DHCD submitted our annual assessment and accountability summary report, which included DHCD's equity policy, our written equity plan, which I just referenced as the framework, our language guidance plan, a list of our community liaisons, and those serving on the agency's equity committee. Uh, I thank members of the committee for the opportunity today to speak in support of this resolution. Thank you, Steph. Stephanie. Next, we're going to go to um, the health department. Um, I'm going to bring up the presentation you guys have, and then you can go ahead and start talking. Good morning. Um, as we wait for that presentation to come out, I do just want to introduce myself, despite what my nameplate says. My name is Dr. Letitia Jarasa, and I'm the Commissioner of Health for Baltimore City. Thank you all for this opportunity to speak on behalf of the Health Department in support of this resolution, recognizing systemic racism as a public health crisis. Next slide. So let's begin by reviewing some of our city demographics. The 2018 American Community Survey indicated that Baltimore City has a population of a little over 600,000 people. Of our residents, roughly 62% are Black and 30% are White. Next slide. When we look more closely at a geographic distribution of city residents per this same survey, you can see that African Americans are largely concentrated in the east and west sides of the city, with Whites largely being located centrally. These patterns are as a result of historical policies like redlining, which was a discriminatory practice that put services like mortgage loans out of reach for residents based on race or ethnicity. We still see the implications of this practice today as reflected by the differences in life expectancy as well as overall poor health, comes, poor health outcomes for our city residents, which are much more prevalent in African American communities here in the city. Dr. Lawrence Brown characterized this phenomenon as the black butterfly and the white L. Next slide. Take the prevalence of smoking, for example. You can see that the higher prevalence of smoking um, across the city very closely mimics that same black butterfly we saw in the previous slide. Next slide. Likewise, when we evaluate the locations of healthy food priority areas, formerly known as food deserts, you see a relatively similar pattern. So given what we know about these disparities and inequities across our city that stem from systemic racism, what is the role of the local health authority? As public health professionals, we focus on promoting and protecting health of an entire population. And in our case, this population is the residents of Baltimore City. We assure the conditions in which people can be healthy. We research disease and injury prevention. We detect, prevent, and respond to infectious diseases like COVID. We educate the community on health risk. We advocate for policies that protect the health of the community. And we partner to help the community live longer and healthier lives. We do all of this through a lens of equity. 
focusing on eliminating disparities that we know exist as a result of structural racism. Next slide. So as a department, our approach has always been to address racism as a public health issue. This is one of our five priority areas in our most recent strategic plan, Be Well, Be More. To date, we have convened an internal department-wide equity committee whose purpose is to address racism as a public health issue. Internally, this group is evaluating our policies and practices and will make formal recommendations for adjustments to ensure equity across the entire department. Externally, this group will also focus on our work in the community to ensure that we are effectively addressing the disparities caused by structural racism. We've already developed a health equity policy outlining procedures to ensure that our programs address specific populations at higher risk for poor health outcomes and focus on inclusion of health equity considerations for those same populations. Many of our senior leadership and a handful of our programs have either hosted or participated in race and equity trainings. Lastly, as a department, we have adopted what's called a health and all policies approach. This is another strategic priority of our department. This collaborative approach integrates and articulates health collaborations in uh, health considerations rather in coordination with policymaking across sectors to improve the health of in communities uh, across the city. This health and all policy approach recognizing that health is created um, by a multitude of factors, um, specifically the social determinants of health. So we know that the environment in which you're, you're born, you live, you work, you play, and you worship influence your health. We know that beyond healthcare, and in many cases, even beyond the scope of traditional public health activities, there is a need to address the broader structural racism that has plagued our country and our city for centuries if we want to have any impact on health outcomes for minority communities. Thank you for this opportunity to speak um, in support of this resolution. Dr. DeRaja, thank you very much. I think that was a great presentation that you gave us and it really highlights uh, systemic racism that actually is still going on in Baltimore City. So we really appreciate your um, um, presentation. Thank you all. Uh, next, we're going to go to uh, the law department. Uh, good morning, um, Mr. Chair and, and um, members of the committee. This is Elena DePetra from the law department. Um, hold on, I'll put on my... Uh, video there so you can see my face. Um, the law department is, is supports and is committed to doing um, and everything within our authority to um, minimize the effect of systemic racism on the health outcomes for Baltimore City residents. Um, we, we, um, our litigation department already does so in many ways by um, defending uh, laws and policies that promote equity against challenges like equal protection and and other constitutional challenges um, with, with, I think, with decent success. Um, we work um, when we, when our, my group is specifically, when we, we, we look at the bills, we look to see whether or not there are constitutional issues or other issues that um, we can uh, fix before they are voted on by the council so that when they, when they go to um, be implemented in the community, they're not subject to challenge that can hold up the implementation of some of these important programs. Um, we look at every proposed law um, uh, with, with, a, with a, you know, considering it that it could be challenged down the road. Um, we support the work of the Mayor's and Women's Business Opportunity Office in, in the law department. Um, we provide a lot of, of uh, advice to them as they try to implement that important program. Uh, we've, we've um, in the past, when the program was just starting to be implemented, the law department successfully defended that program against a number of um, constitutional challenges um, that were happening all across the country, and we were one of the programs that was, that was successfully um, defended. Um, we've also started a dialogue in the law department about um, equity, um, allowing the members of the law department to speak to each other and get, gain a great understanding of um, what 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 racism and systemic racism is and how it's, it was affected members of the law department during their lives. Um, uh, our labor department is is working hard to make sure that EEO rules are followed and that uh, discrimination in employment is minimized. And that's just a, a snapshot of some of the things that are happening in the law department every day. I mean, it's 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 on our radar every day when we do our work um, to um, make sure that the citizens of Baltimore um, are able to um, begin to try to overcome the effects of systemic racism. 
Sam, real quick, do we have all this um, um written testimony? Do we have that all on record? Is it, I would just want to make sure we put it in the file. Mr. Chair, um, I, I submitted a, a, a bill report that was very generic. So I, I will I will write these notes down and, and submit an additional report. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we're going to go to the um, parks and recreations. Uh, Miss Jenny Morgan, if she's on. Hear me? Yes, we hear you now. Okay. I was having some audio issues. Um, good morning, I'm Jenny Morgan. I'm the legislative liaison for Baltimore City Recreation and Parks. Um, we submitted an agency report, but um, in addition, I wanted to add the following statement. The Baltimore City Recreation and Parks is a CAPRA certified member of the National Recreation and Parks Association. What that means is that we're set to a specific set of standards in what we provide to the community. The three pillars of the NRPA are the same as ours at BCRP, conservation, health and wellness, and social equity. What that means to Baltimore is that we serve as essential partners in combating some of the most complicated and expensive challenges that our city faces, including poor nutrition, hunger, obesity, and physical inactivity. We have a daily commitment to ensure social equity. We work hard to ensure that all members of the community have equal access to parks, resources, and programming. Our prime directive, as it were, hinges on our ability to eliminate any practice that stems from implicit bias and structural racism. When much of the city shut down during the early days of the coronavirus, BCRP staff became the frontline workers. Our 44 recreation centers became distribution sites serving meals and grocery items. To date, we have given out over 1 million meals. While our centers aren't operating under normal conditions, we are currently offering a wide range of limited participant programming in STEM, computer literacy, fitness, mentoring, music, dance, arts and crafts, and outdoor nature activities. We are currently working with Baltimore City Schools hosting student learning centers, offering students without internet access and computers a place to go so that they can keep up with their schoolwork. When looking at upcoming capital investment, we have developed a scoring system that measures a variety of criteria with social equity carrying the greatest weight. Our agency continues to be committed to serving the citizens of Baltimore and by eliminating any practice within our communities that stem from implicit bias, systemic racism, and or are contrary to our mission and vision. Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, um, Sam, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Next, we're gonna hear from uh, the police department, uh, Michelle Wurzberger. Hi, good, uh, good morning. Sam, can you please elevate Bill Joyner, who will um, uh, be uh, contributing to our testimony this morning? Um, for the record, Michelle Wurzberger, Director of Government Affairs for the Baltimore Police Department. Uh, uh, we have submitted our bill report um, that is also an equity analysis that was prepared uh, by Mr. Joyner for the department. Um, and he will briefly expand upon, uh, there, he, there he is. Um, all right, so I will uh, stop talking and turn it over to Bill. <laughs> Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Good morning, my name is Bill Joyner, equity officer at the Baltimore Police Department. Um, and so as Director Wurzberger mentioned, we have submitted a bill report. Um, and so the BPD is committed to dismantling systemic racism, um, beginning by destroying our institutional contributions to that system of discriminatory outcomes. Under the consent decree, the BPD has begun the process of overhauling our policies, training, technology, supervision, and other functions of the organization that have produced disproportionately negative outcomes for Black, non-white, Hispanic, and other marginalized people. Selected examples of this ongoing reform include the development of new policies um, requiring, for example, limited use of force, fair and partial policing, and we also have created the behavioral health sort of crisis response team. But holistic reform requires institutional and systemic reform to be effective, and because dismantling racism requires addressing its root causes, not just its symptoms, BPD employs a systems approach 
that demands collaboration with agencies capable of addressing the conditions that lead to police intervention. We think our reforms and crisis response illustrate the differences. New policies, officer training, and accountability measures are early efforts to address institutional reform, improving those outcomes connected to BPD. But the BPD also coordinates with the Collaborative Planning and Implementation Committee, which conducted an analysis of gaps in the behavioral health system in Baltimore that must be addressed in order to provide the most effective, least police-involved response to behavioral health crises. This systemic approach identifies and mobilizes the most appropriate resources and other institutions needed to support positive mental health, which may or may not involve the police at all. And so the focus is on improving the outcome for the community by leveraging all institutions in the system when and where they have a role to play. We think this systems level approach um, can be scaled to meet broader public health needs rooted in racism, housing segregation, employment discrimination, public school disinvestment, unaffordable health care. They're just some of the race-based factors contributing to community violence, a major public health issue that disproportionately harms Black and non-white Hispanic residents in Baltimore. And while BPD works to more equitably detect, disrupt, and deter violence, effective violence prevention requires systemic deployment of resources only available outside of BPD to the people who need those resources most. Addressing racial disparities earlier in the process will compound BPD's ability to reduce these racial disparities in police interactions and reduce the overall need for police intervention. So we support passage of City Council Resolution 20028R, and we look forward to participating in this conversation uh, going forward and the activities that will lead to systemic outcomes related to systemic racism. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, next we're gonna to go to the uh, Department of Planning, uh, Ms. Stephanie Smith. Yep. Thank, you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee. Um, I am here on behalf of the Department of Planning where I serve as Assistant Director for Equity, Engagement and Communications. And in that position, um, we um, you know, have already um, formulated a commitment to addressing systemic inequity and racism, and thus we um, stand in, in affirmation and full support of the resolution as um, drafted. Um, we did submit a bill report for your consideration and review, but I do want to lift up a few highlights. Um, there have been some stats that have been provided by our sister agencies that I will not um, repeat in the interest of time, but I do want to lift up some of the specific work we've been doing in our um, agency to not only identify um, how we can address issues of um, systemic um, racism, but how we can also work with our um, sister agencies um, in that effort. Um, first off, um, before the uprising of 2015, um, the Department of Planning um, did engage in its own um, equity trainings and um, subsequently formed an equity action, excuse me, equity and planning committee. And that, and that committee um, established um, an equity action plan. And that action plan, um, um, which precedes the equity um, um, law that was passed by council um, a couple of years ago was really focused on um, five key areas. We wanted to figure out how we could improve and increase the dialogue and connections between the department and um, underserved communities in, in Baltimore. We wanted to ensure that our um, pipeline for hiring and staff reflected the demographics of Baltimore City. And we wanted to use an equity lens to develop, revise, and evaluate um, city policies as well as our own internal policies and practices. And lastly, we wanted to utilize an equity lens to prioritize, prioritize capital investments. Now, in terms of an equity lens, um, we have um, borrowed and adapted an equity lens that was created by the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. Um, the Office of Sustainability, which is a division of the Department of Planning, um, because um, of its existence, um, the city of Baltimore is a member of the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. And the four-part lens they use looks at um, structural equity, procedural equity, distributional equity, and transgenerational equity. And with your brief indulgence, I do want to um, discuss the one-sentence prompts that each of those um, lens points um, um, begs us to, to um, ask. When we're um, trying to assess how structural equity um, is impacting a decision-making process or a plan, our planning process, we ask ourselves, what is the historic advantage or disadvantage that have affected residents in a given community? 
when we're addressing issues of procedural equity, and I think this is of critical importance, many, much of the work of city government does not necessarily necessitate a statute or an ordinance in order to modify. There's a, a lot of latitude we have as agencies to adapt our, our procedures to be more accessible and to be more um, adaptable to the needs of the citizens we serve. So we ask ourselves, which residents have been historically excluded from a planning process? How can we authentically include them in the planning, implementation, and evaluation of a proposed policy or project. Um, distributional equity, it's how we um, analyze the distribution of power within a given or resources within a given population or um, geography. And because as um, other um, um, witnesses and testimony have uh, provided, we are a city um, that has been largely shaped by residential segregation patterns. And that distribution across geography can in many ways be a proxy for distribution within racial groups. And then lastly, um, something we sometimes do not discuss, but the intersection between transgenerational equity and um, systemic racism is important. Um, do we consider how our policies or projects result in unfair burdens on future generations? So with that lens in mind, we have tackled our five point equity action plan utilizing that lens and some of the highlights of that um, work has been establishing a Baltimore Planning Academy, which really um, emphasizes participation from our historically redlined in um, communities and communities that presently have the weakest housing markets as reflected in the housing market typology. So this is a six week course that is really developing um, leaders to be more on the offense as they engage in the land use and development system, because we know that investments in the built environment have a direct relationship to public health. And we know that the lack of investment in certain parts of our city have contributed to health disparities. We also have conducted and are continuing to conduct an on ongoing analysis of our capital improvement um, program. And um, we are also um, currently in the midst of piloting an approach that integrates the, um, the planning um, officers from every agency and assessing for equity and other key indicators, including public health and, um, and wellness and public welfare. Um, ability to score these um, these um, projects in a more holistic way so that we can have outcomes that are much more beneficial um, to the public at large. Uh, and then we also have a sustainability plan, which this council adopted and was the first citywide plan that was um, developed with the equity lens and will be implemented with an equity lens. Um, I, I don't want to list all of our um, projects, but I do think that it's important to lift up that climate change is probably the largest existential threat we face um, as, as humanity. And um, quite frankly, we know that the impacts of climate change are not felt evenly um, through this world, nation, or at the very local level in Baltimore City. So we've established resiliency hubs in collaboration with community-based um, organizations that we supply with resources and support to help communities on the ground navigate not only threats um, born out of, um, of weather phenomenon, but also human unrest, the, the, the global pandemic we find ourselves in presently. So we realize that we need to um, give resources to where they're most needed. That's what equity is about. And if I were to um, leave you with just one last thought, we appreciate the efforts of the council to address this important issue. And we just wanna reiterate emphatically that equality and equity um, should not be conflated because if we do things equally, we could actually be exacerbating equity. So our work is about bringing resources, support and insight to the communities that have been least served by our um, our um, participation in the past, our contributions in the past, um, and that is with an eye to equity being realized for the city of Baltimore. Thank you for your time and thank you for bringing forth this very important resolution. Hey, hey Sam, real quick, um, I see the state's attorney's office. Do we have anybody here from the state's attorney's office? Um, they didn't send over a name with any panelists. Um, if they're on, they're more than welcome to speak. Okay, I'm actually looking at um, the Office of Civil Rights and Wage. Have somebody here from there? Mm -hmm. Yes, good morning, Chair. Okay. And the other members of the panel. The Office of Equity and Civil Rights has had an opportunity to review City Council Resolution 20-0218R and shares the sponsor's commitment. We encourage the mayor and the city council provide the necessary resource to engage the Baltimore City Health Department and other agencies of the city government gathering the need 
that the needed data to inform and create action steps to address systemic, institutional, subconscious, overt, and all other forms of racism within the city of Baltimore. The Office of Equity and Civil Rights, through its monthly community dialogue series, annual Civil Rights Week and Fair Housing Film Festival activities, and community par partnerships um, with the community at large in discussing the issue on several occasions since its inception in 2018. It is our to continue to work with the public and private sector to use our social media platforms and, and other various outreach to the public to model, to address the issue of racism and thereby improve the quality of life and various forms of racism that contribute to inequity, poverty, and injustice in the city of Baltimore. To that end, we also agree, agree with the American Public Health Association's position, and uh, that is in the report or resolution letter that was submitted. In conclusion, the Office of Equity and Civil Rights remains committed to fairness and equity for the residents of the city of Baltimore and support this resolution. And we see that it is our position to continue to educate and advocate for residents of the city of Baltimore and will continue to work and partner with agencies within the city and the community at large. Thank you. Thank you. Um, real quick, I would like to recognize Rebecca Simmons, who is the general counsel for President Scott's office. We also had Nia Thimlis from the mayor's office, um, Matt Stegman from the mayor's office. We also have, real quick, okay, and uh, Kaelin Young from President Scott's office also. Um, I guess that's all the reports, am I correct, Sam, because I want to move on to our next part of this um, hearing. Yeah, the only one that didn't go was uh, Liam, and I'm not, I see him on yeah. okay. the line we can him, him, but I didn't know if he was able to talk. Hey, how's it going, everybody? This is Liam. Um, so, uh, DOT stands by its bill report. Um, you know, we, we are in support of this resolution. Um, systemic racism is a serious problem that, um, you know, it's, it's rooted in decisions from years ago, and it, it, it continues to impact the citizens of Baltimore negatively um, in many ways today. Um, and... Um, you know, specifically from a transportation perspective, um, it's evident in projects um, and infrastructure that that were built and in projects that were never built. Um, and we mentioned this in our bill report, um, perhaps the greatest example of, of infrastructure that, that has been built that is a glaring example of systemic racism and has public health impact is... Um, the highway to nowhere in West Baltimore, um, which was a a project that resulted in the demolition of over 18 square blocks of um, predominantly um, black West Baltimore. It um, resulted in the displacement of thousands of people, um, contributed to social isolation and, uh, you know, increased air pollution. The list goes on. Um, in terms of projects that we were never able to see come to fruition that impact us today, um, there were plans in the 1960s to have a very robust metro subway system. And part of the reason why that that was never built was racism from majority Caucasian suburban counties that did not want the subways, um, subway stations going out to their, to their jurisdictions. So these, these short sighted policy decisions impact the people of Baltimore to this day and is undoubtedly, um, contributing to a major public health crisis. So that we do stand by our bill report. Um, I also include some things that we're doing in DOT to work to mitigate um, the impact of these legislative policy decisions. But in the interest of time, I will uh, yield to the chair. Uh, thank you, um, Liam, for your honest statement. Um, I want to actually now move on to we have a panelist of three um, 
Dosh Monterell, who is the president of um, New Broadway East. Keisha Webster, who is the founding member of the Greenmount West Community Foundation, who's doing some great things in Greenmount West. And Harold Madison, who is the voice of the voiceless, and not just in East Baltimore, but throughout the city. So I want to make sure everybody is on so we can start the discussion with the uh, three panels I just mentioned. Harold, you on? I'm here. Uh, Dars, Mina, Terrell. Good morning, everybody. Keisha Webster. Good morning, I'm here. Okay, I just want to start off by asking, and let Keisha start off, just um, just give us an open comments, and then uh, Dars, and then Harold Madison. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Stokes. Um, you know, I, I will tell you, honestly, I'm in like a mental place right now because we were able to hear from every institution, um, every, um, you know, organization on behalf of the city that's doing work, has made the acknowledgement of sexual racism. Um, so the acknowledgement is there. I think where I am now is in this place of, so what is the redress? Um, we know that because of redlining, generational wealth, that gap is so wide between black and white people in Baltimore City. Where is the reparations in that? Where is the atonement? Um, you know, Dr. Davis talks about that there's a history of trauma and stress that trains us to constantly censor ourselves, to adjust ourselves, to mute ourselves, to filter ourselves. I'm going to be honest right now, I'm not going to do any of that um, because I am truly on the path of healing from post-traumatic slave syndrome, disrupting systemic racism and sexism. And so I just cannot adjust myself in that way anymore. Um, I'm in Greenmount West, a community that is often lauded because of level of development that has gone on in this community. Yet what people don't understand is that has been a development of buildings. There was no true investment in the people that are here. No millions of dollars have been made from this community and taken from this community. No one took the time to truly invest in the people. And so my hope is that, you know, the city council, those who are in positions of authority in this city, begin to recognize the importance of being very intentional about the redress, the reparations that need to come to legacy residents, their children, because this generational wealth gap is real. And we know that if you create a life that you're always in the hole, no matter what policies you have in place, if people are not investing in you, investing in community, investing in your projects, you will continuously have a family that is struggling. Um, and so whether that is health-wise, whether that is education, it doesn't matter and said so there'll definitely be some to be some form of reparations for people who have suffered especially black people in this city um that's what i've not heard i know the importance of policy but policy means nothing if you do not have resources attached to it to make things better and what i've heard is a lot of policies i'm also concerned with that i know for a fact structural racism has grandchildren and those grandchildren are um, intrinsic oppression, intrinsic racism. So I know even though there are black people who are doing this work on behalf of black people in the city, they're still dealing with their own trauma. And sometimes that can come off in a worse way than structural racism because they don't even know how to process the pains that black people who look like them have gone through. So representation is insufficient. There must be individuals who are very much invested in black people who are creating opportunities for black people and brown people and any other group of people, marginalized people in this city to thrive. And I'm not seeing that. This pandemic has really shown me about the financial fragility that is going on in this city. And the majority of the people that we are supporting at the Greenmount West Community Center Foundation are black women and girls. And so you cannot have my brother's keeper without investing in black women and girls. So already there's a there's a there's a system that already tells us who we should invest in. 
And that system is based on structural racism because when people see, white people see black boys on the street or black men, there's an initial fear. Yet you have to realize that there are black women and black girls who are still going through the pains and they need to be invested in an equitable manner, manner as well. So I will tell you that I'm processing a lot of what I've heard in the last 45 minutes. Um, a lot of people have talked a great deal about you know, what their offices are doing. But honestly, you know, I'm not seeing it in, in Green Mount West. And we're supposed to be the community that is thriving because of our $500,000 homes. So I'm still processing. Thank you, Councilman Stokes. Thank you, Ms. Webster, for that honest, honest, honest um, quote and statement that you made. And I agree with you. You got to attach money to policies and that money. That's what I want to see. So we will be when we recess this, we will be going back to these agencies. I want to see money attached with policy because policy sounds good, but the money has to be there to make it work. So uh, Ms. Douglas Mona Terrell, real quick. Good morning again, everybody. And I'd like to thank Keisha Webster for giving us that detailed Uh, I guess what I'm continuing to be concerned about as I heard each person expressing his or her concern for what's taking place is Can you all hear Doris? No, I cannot hear her. No, I cannot. Oh, no, Doris, we can't hear you. Doris, we cannot hear you. Can we come back to you, Doris, and have um, uh, Harold go ahead and sit? You have two minutes over. Okay, hey, Rob. Okay, thank go you. ahead. Go ahead, Harold. Okay, thank you, Councilman. And you know, this is a very important milestone for the community. You know, giving a voice in this process is key. But we got to also remember that this has been a problem for over 400 years. And then you have now we're talking to the patient about the patient, but you don't know the patient. The conditions that we have suffered over these 400 years has led us to realize what the issues are that we're now currently being faced. But the conditions of the people after facing these things over 400 years has put us in a position where they don't know. Civility. Civility is the key. If you're going to have transparency, you have to realize that the patient is sick, has been beat up, has been dismayed, described in this process. How will we ensure that throughout this process, that the voice of the community will be taken into consideration and also as a leading factor to build generational understanding. Because the languages that I heard earlier was a language that is accepted by the government. But what about the people? What is the language of the people? Right now, it's like we're living in an unruly barnyard and everybody's for themselves. But I commend the councilman for taking this on to bring those professionals to the day table, to give us a voice with those professionals and to lead us towards an agenda that we can have a plan that can be implemented that would work for the city of Baltimore. So basically, Rob, that's where I bring the voice from the community. I want to make sure that there's transparency and clear and evidential information that all of these ever uh, agencies that the city has with all of this information, why did it take so long to get to this point? You know, even with this digital divide in communications, you know, how can we bring the citizens on board if they don't have access to the internet? Every citizen in Baltimore City should be listening from a standpoint of how they feel, what they feel, and how they would like to give some input to how we should resolve this issue. 
Okay, Mr. Madison, thank you for those um, honest words. Uh, Mrs. Terrell, are you back? Yes, can you hear me, Councilman? Yes, we can, thank you. Thanks, I'm sorry. Um, I'm having technical difficulty. My concern is centered around how will those in authority address the decision makers who continue to make decisions rooted in racism? Mr. Liam Davis addressed that subject well, but I did not hear what is the plan that should be in place to address those who continue to function with bad habits. We have over the period of the years not been able to change that process. You can look today what is happening to, to us from the White House standpoint. We still are not able to have consequences in place for people who make decisions rooted in racism. We have talked about the process we seem to have somewhat of a plan, but you did not tell me how you would deal with those people that you know are making decisions that are not in the best interest of all people, not making decisions along the racial divide that has continued to happen. If there is anyone who can address that, I would greatly appreciate it, but I'm looking forward to knowing that you are going to put out a plan that says he or she that makes a decision rooted in racism and we can fully document that we have a plan for you. Thank you, Mrs. Doris Montebrell. Um, um, Mr. Sam, is there any public testimony also? Um. Before we go there, um, I think we should go to the um, on the committee to see if they have any questions for the agency or the panelists. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, you're right. Um, any of the committee members, you have any questions? I apologize. <laughs> Councilman McCray, you have any questions? No, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, for the public testimony, if individuals could use the raise hand function on your screen, if you would like to provide public testimony, um, use the raise hand function. Um, I do know that um, Ms. Yolanda uh, Jiggett from Park Heights Renaissance offered written testimony. We'll go to her to see if she has anything that she would like to say on behalf of Park Heights Renaissance. And anybody else that wants to um, provide any public testimony, please use the raise hand function. Ms. Jiggett, Ms. Gidget. Ms. Jiggett, are you on? Ms. Jiggett. Okay, um, Sam, let's let's um move on. It sounds like we're having some audio problems. So what I wanted to do was um start off with a question for the three panelists. My first oh, question. Oh. I'm sorry. Uh, Councilman, um, I cannot pronounce this individual's name. I think it's Khalif Kasim, or we can go to them. They had a um, question. I mean, uh, um, public testimony. Hold on one second. And Miss Jiggy says she is muted. Okay, we'll go back to her after. Um, Khal Khalif, you hear yes. me? Yep. It's Khalif. All right, thank you, sir. Yeah, Khalif Tashif. Okay. Uh, I've been a long-term, long-time Baltimore resident, and um, this, this is a wonderful uh, event that I'm, I'm happy and privy to. 
Um, I want to address the um, impact, the health impact, the mental and psychological impact of a majority black city that really has not had the access to uh, the Inner Harbor and that whole 8.3 mile um, stretch along uh, what you call Fells Point, but the uh, our our coastline, you know, our Inner Harbor coastline. I think it's about eight eight miles or so, right? But uh, it's always been a restriction. Uh, and it's always been ownership is not there. When you look at 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 the majority more majority black city, and if this was any other kind of city, you know, majority population of any other kind of people, uh, you would see them represented, uh, pre you know, predominantly uh, or at least uh, greatly represented uh, in the marinas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I would like to have that explored. Because we have people uh, that own uh, yachts and boats and love to go boating, but they're restricted. And you have a cabal that I'm aware of that uh, has kind of seized management ship in the face of majority black, like, like we don't have sense or the intelligence to manage certain things. And that is city-owned property for the most part. I'm talking about the promenade areas, a lot of the waterfront areas, uh, around the Frederick Douglass uh, traditional area. Uh, all that is, how is that managed by, by Caucasian people or people that, are, uh, uh, that don't represent the greater population? And we're talking about racism. And if we, if we want to talk about it, we really have to speak as adults. And not like, uh, well, shh, shh, you shouldn't say that. Uh, we don't want to say. You, you understand? That's not governance. That's not governance. That's not proper governance. Proper governance is facing something uh, forth, forthrightly and actually doing something about it and not, well, well we're going to push it off and have the next meeting uh, to meet on what we met on today. And then the next meeting, we're going to meet on what we met on today. And it's a perpetual delaying tactic. I'm an elder. And I've seen this over and over again, over and over, and people come and go. People with good intentions come and go. And uh, I hope this, this young generation, especially speaking to Brother Robert Stokes, uh, uh, he's seen it. I know because he's also an elder. Uh, but, I, you know, we got to stop this, and and we have to create uh, non-restriction. It reminds me of apartheid, of a kind of benign, but it's blatant apartheid when you're conscious. You see, the more conscious and aware of we we are of it, uh, the more sensitive we are to it. The more blatant it appears to us. So <laughs> the lack of ownership around the inner harbor. The, and the lack of, of manage, management represented, representation around the inner harbor. It's not there for us. And then the picking and pecking about people. No, people who have a genuine interest in maritime affairs uh, should have a say. And that should be an open discussion. And I hope the new administration that's coming in uh, uh, will, will not go by the old paradigm and be just a foreman on a plantation, a well-run plantation. I hope that's not where we're going. Mr. Kashi, uh, thank you for your uh, testimony. Uh, and the reason why I'm doing this is because uh, Ms. Webster talked about it. We want to make sure that money is attached to the policies that the other agencies are talking about. And that's why we're going to recess when we finish this, because we're going to have agents to report back and how where's the funding source to make this change here in this and in Baltimore City. So again, I thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And Mrs. Jiggett, I don't know if she's unmuted. Ms. Jiggett. Hi everyone. Good morning. 
Um, first of all, um, I wanted to thank and applaud the sponsors of this resolution. Um, we all agree that this is a public health matter. And um, I think the solution begins with acknowledgement. So thank you all for um, sponsoring this resolution and bringing it to the forefront of the discussion. Um, secondly, um, as you all have said, and I'll say on record, there must be a true commitment to developing long-term sustainable solutions that address the devastating impacts that continue to have impacts on communities of color. And I think some of the next steps are ensuring that we effectively allow community feedback and participation, not in a planning session, but in implement implementation strategies. Um, and lastly, um, as everyone has said, uh, Councilman Stokes has repeated, um, we have to have a focus on effective deployment of necessary resources. Um, and that, to me, we all know that the resources are needed, um, but I think that goals for this coming year is how do we improve that coordination um, many of us at the community level are scrambling and competing um, for the same funding sources rather than working collaboratively to leverage those opportunities and funding. I would love to see um, assistance from the top um, leadership and how we as community development uh, corporations, organizations, service providers work more collaboratively um, so that those um, funds are leveraged more effectively. Um, you know, I speak on behalf of Park Heights, but um, across the city in general, our communities continue to be impacted by, you know, high rates of unemployment. Again, vacant and blighted properties that we continue to let uh, sit in our communities and lack of strong accountability measures for um, absentee property owners that continue to drive down the value um, in our communities. And I don't see um, uh, the type of movement that is really needed to address those vacant and blighted properties. Um, you know, we have a lot of solutions, we have a lot of resources, but you cannot deny the impact that it has on a community member who is a taxpayer and a homeowner who has to, for years and years and years, tolerate and try to address a vacant property that is next to their property. And we give these vacant property owners five, six years to do something and we spend millions of dollars in legal fees to try to address those issues. So, I mean, I wanna get down to the root of how, to, how do we begin to really address those type of impacts that have happened over decades of neglect, um, particularly around uh, systemic racist practices and policies that have been happening in our neighborhoods across Baltimore City um, for far too long. So I, I would just end by saying uh, Park Heights Renaissance definitely supports the passage of this council resol resolution. Um, and we look forward to being a part of the collaborative and collective leadership to reverse the drastic uh, and dramatic impacts that continue to impact our communities in Baltimore City. So, you know, I want to say publicly that I want to be a part of this solution, but we can't do it alone. Uh, it involves, it takes a commitment to truly involve uh, community leaders and hear their um, testimonies and to also include them in yes. the process to make change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Jiggets. I really appreciate your testimony. Um, I now want to move on to the panelists so we can, um, um, first of all, Sam, there's no other, no one that want to speak from the public side, is it? Uh, no, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to just start off with these the three panels, Dodge Minor Terrells, Keisha Webster, and Earl Madison. And I just have a, a, a question just to ask them. Um, how do you find systemic racism? 
the other one stop first, they can. I'm sorry, Councilman Sills, please repeat that. How do you define systemic racism? It is the fabric of American life. Um, it is an intentional way to black people. That's how it was started. That was his, that was his plan to cause harm, um, to to undervalue. To um, it's it's when it's embedded in any and all system that are anything that we need on a daily basis. So whether it is the air that we breathe, and certain areas have you know trash dumping in that area, the schools in our neighborhoods. It is something that is embedded. It's like the blood in our veins. That's what systemic racism is. It is the blood in the veins of American society um, that causes harm, that causes that we kill people. So it's that it's it's like you know a drug in your system that is just killing you, and it, it was created to kill people. It was created to devalue, um, and so that's why you have every agency a part of this conversation because it's in all of those spaces, and it has led to black people, brown people, indigenous people being devalued, 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 and instead of looking at the system, people will say, "Well, it's because they're black." It's because they're indigenous. It's because of they're brown. No, you have to look. It's the system. It's not the race. The system created this. Councilman Stokes, uh, I'd like to follow Teacher Webster's uh, dynamic statement, her definition of systemic racism, and add just a small part to it. It is the foundation of the capitalistic system that the United States of America continues to follow. There has been no change since the exception of how we need to manage this system. You start with your enslaved population and continue that process to the current date, 2020, and you will review in history that there has been no significant change, just a change in the process of how you manage those you need to continue to make sure that they are the root reason for your ability to have economic dignity. Thank you, Ms. Terrell. Um, Mr. Madison? Yeah, so, Rob, I'd just like to keep it simple because, you know, this resolution that's being proposed says what systemic racism has impacted. So the reasons are now lack of access, equity, involvement, civility. Baltimore City is a municipality. Where are the rules to the game? If you never had the rules and you're playing the game, there's a problem. Not just with the resi residential people, the institutional people. Because you can't run a municipality without the people. And the people can't play the game if they don't know the rules to the game. So now we're being faced with looking at the rules. And who were the authors? And who all participated in denying the access to the citizens and holding them accountable? That's the voice of the community. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Madison. Now, uh, the panelists, I, I would just like to ask the panelists if they have any questions that y'all like to discuss among yourselves. I think that's important also. I do want to address something that Brother Madison just shared. Um, so we know that this was not a game that we were supposed to master. You know, we know this. And I think in order for us to be able to disrupt this system, we have to be extremely innovative and bold. We know what is needed. So it shouldn't be about us trying to learn the rules of this game. We already know that the game is going to kill many of us. 
And though there may be a couple of people who are the MVPs and are able to step above this, their blackness, their wealth will not, their wealth won't shield them. Their degrees won't shield them. And so it's not about us learning this game. This is about us disrupting and being innovative and in how we're going to do things differently. And that can be done. I think there used to be universal income for people in the city of Baltimore. I think there needs to be direct spaces in every community that are beautiful, that allows people to go there and, and just relax and breathe and be at peace. So we're going to have to be bold in our initiatives. This is not about trying to learn a game that was not created for us. I think that's a waste of energy. Well, when we, when, when we talk about the game, you know, you bring in professionalism. You're bringing in health modalities and not looking from a holistic standpoint. Then things have been thought out well by those institutions who provide us with those professionals. And as we go up against them, we're saying to them, now is the time for you to repent. Because if we come up with a solution, okay, this is criminal. And it's accountability. Some people are going to be in prison for what they have done. How can you take a city that's a municipality chartered and take the valuation from the people and give it to the housing staff and give historical validation? And yet to know that these conditions have been placed upon the people for so many years that it has come to a resolution to resolve. Thank you, Mr. Matt. Uh, Mrs. Um, Dawes, do you have any comments? Uh, yes, Councilman Stokes. I'd like to say to the other panelists and attendees, I think today is the day that we pull the covers off or the start of pulling the covers off, and there should be no turning back. Exposure, exposure, exposure. We need to have those people who continue to make decisions that are not in the best interest of all people to be brought to the table with an explanation of why do you continue to practice this racism? Thank you. I agree with you with that, Ms. Doris. You are so right. We must begin to hold all people who are in a position of any type of power accountable. You have to hold people accountable. In the same capacity that they hold the principal of a school accountable, if the if the um, scores of the students aren't well, if if the if there is no community engagement, that principal is gone. They need to okay. have the same level of accountability. It needs to be okay. You're not doing the things you're supposed to do, then you can go. But I think if people had this sense of understanding and sense of urgency that there's a lot of work to be done and you're going to be held accountable. Exactly. My, my, my same sentiments and my concern, Councilman, is that when it comes to the table and you say follow the money, are we preparing to place in there an endowment that will send it off into a perpetuity that we can begin to continue to put forth the plan that will provide with legacy. Because this is not something we're just going to talk about today and it's going to go away tomorrow. We've That's now opened it. So we need to know that there's a certain allotment for the citizens of Baltimore and their care that is placed in an endowment that can help transfer them from being a deprived community to a community that's going to be resourceful. Okay, I have, a, I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, how, if either one of the panels, how do you manage the daily racial injustice you face? I sometimes go home and take a nap. Because <laughs> if you deal with this, you know, it is constant. So whether it's racism, whether it's sexism, it is a constant. Um, and, and what I've learned to do is be very selective about what I'm responding to. 
because you cannot respond to 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 all of it all the time because you will go mad and so what i have valued is the understanding that this is real i am experiencing so i do acknowledge it i don't say oh this is my imagination i know <laughs> i am experiencing i know it's in my face i've learned to just i gotta step back because if i respond to this every time you know you know, I, I i will i wouldn't be helping it and so you have to be very selective about what you respond to and when you do respond you already know how this could get better so i'm not waiting for people to tell me well Keisha, we got the answer for you no i don't need the answer what i do need are the necessary resources to invest in in the community in which i serve that's what i need what i i don't need more research i know how to do research i don't need that what i need is more resources what I need is for people to stop this performative philanthropy of giving black people, black led organizations, $10,000 for a year and thinking we're going to save the world. What I need is for white led organizations to step back and let black people who are truly committed to the community to do the work. That's what I need. I need for our public officials to really tell certain organizations that no, you have no background in this. So why are you using the demographics of black people to make money? Because that's what's happening in this city. And that's the part that's so disheartening is that you see it every day. And you just have to make a decision about, okay, I can't respond to this today. Let me go take a nap. <laughs> Let me go have a cup of tea. Kind <laughs> and honest words, Ms. West. Uh, um, Gerald or uh, Ms. Dodge, you have to talk. Well, well, Rob, I, I, it does. I'll speak. Um, for, for me, Rob, it's been a lifelong journey here in Baltimore. Military veteran coming back home to serve my community and to find out that it was so disruptive. I placed the corporation together back in 1996. And I began to write these things down that I found very uh, systemic that was in denying access as a business person. And I just surrendered myself and started volunteering and being a part of a solution base, planting the seeds in the mind of the young people. For example, the golf course. We have a beautiful golf course in East Baltimore, Clifton Park. But we've been denied the access of administrative understanding. How did it come about? Where did it come from? And who's manipulating the money? So those things are noted. So we have evidence base. And we're preparing from the community out to take action. So those that know what they know, this is the time for them to repent and come forth with some solution-based resolve for the citizens of Baltimore City. Thank you, Mr. Earl. Uh, Ms. Doris? Uh, I'm gonna make a comment around your question. Um, First of all, racism creates depression yes. for people of color. We deal with it every day. So then people want to know why your drinking habits increase. Well, if you spend a lifetime fighting racism, you try to select something that will give you some relief. And oftentimes, people turn to alcohol and or drugs. Harold has pointed out a funding issue and so did keisha point out a funding issue you tend not and you being the structural agencies that are responsible for funding you tend not to put the same kind of money or the capital into black communities that can be managed to buy them you consistently insist that we have an overseer and that overseer tends to be the organization that you believe can make the best decisions. But unless you have boots on the ground, you really don't know what the needs are. You use your data 
and frequently your data does not represent the real problem. It yes. represents the problem that you have assumed is key to that particular population. That's true, Doris. <laughs> Thank you, Doris. I'm saying I I I'm, I see a friend of mine, um, Al Pena. I think he's um on as the call in. Can we um have him? Can we go back and have um Al Pena to speak? Can you can you can you hear me? Yeah, Al. Thank you for calling. Al Pena is um Al. Tell him exactly what you're doing. He came to Baltimore. We did a a, a summit on um. Uh, down at the um, um, the Black Museum downtown, uh, and it was we brought in the Federal Reserve and the bank presidents to be in front of the Federal Reserve to let them know that they're not lending to people of color here in Baltimore City and throughout the country. And Al Pena was there all the way from Florida, so Al was calling all the way from Florida. So Al, you you ready? To go ahead and speak. All right, thank you, Councilman Stokes. I mean, I'm sorry for the, I'm actually on video, but for some reason, this is the first time I use WebEx, so my video is not connected, but at least the voice is. Uh, I'm the chair of the Florida Minority Community Investment Coalition, but something that new that, you know, I'm an economic civil rights advocate, you know, trained out of California by those who work closely with Cesar Chavez. And we have been focusing on uh, minority economics, you know, for the, uh, around the country for the past 15 years. Um, the um the and i like what i'm hearing it's all to me it's still for me everything kind of boils down to economics and the one thing that this pandemic exposed is a historic socioeconomic fault line in the u.s economy for blacks and latinos blacks and latinos by far have suffered the most but that showed that the economics you know that then triggered off the social piece you know is out of whack for our country but also what people are seeing is that that's not good for, you know, our, for our uh, country's future. So what a lot of us have done, we're organizing black Latino community leaders around the country coming under something called the National Minority Com uh, Community Reinvestment Cooperative. And we're launching it with the first ever national black Latino economic summit, virtual black and economic summit, December 9th and 10th. You can go to www.blacklatino.com dot org and get information on it but what we're doing is i mean let me talk about baltimore and one economic point that says it all blacks account for 63 percent of baltimore's population yet they contribute less than five percent of baltimore's gdp what that really says is product gdp is about production consumption product uh, consumption productivity which is jobs and leads to consumption. I can actually reverse that in Los Angeles, and the same will hold true for Latinos. So if you look at any, one thing that and the Brookings Institute actually showed that both Black and Latinos account for most major overseeing populations, but we, we have little or no economic standing. And that's a lot, Councilman Stokes, what we dealt with over in, uh, at, at the uh, museum. But what we're doing to do something about it, and like I, I've heard a lot of this, on this phone call, talking doesn't mean anything, it's action. How can we transfer that into action? And what we're doing is organizing the summit, but the most important work comes uh, after the summit. And by the way, the, the it's a national summit, but we have two black businesses in Baltimore who are putting together uh, Soji Productions and Blackout Studios out of Baltimore are actually putting this on for us. And, but what we've done, we've assembled some of the biggest banks, CEOs, almost every major bank person who's in charge of capital and investments. We brought in the Federal Reserve Board, the head of, of the entire uh, uh, Sierra Investments, and we're putting it to task on this seminar, on these sessions over two days. What are you going to do to economically uplift the black and Latino communities. And it's showing some things that we have going on. Like the, we have the CRA right now, right now as we speak, right now as we speak, the CRA Community Reinvestment Act is being revised and updated because of this pandemic. 
And the rules are changing. Mind you, the CRA has to do with access to capital for small business and housing, but, dominant, but really investment. But let me, as it relates to Baltimore, but let me show you how they, how the banks have made a mockery of the CRA in the past 30 years. Did you know that CRA is where you can invest low, uh, that banks are mandated to invest in low moderate income neighborhoods. Well, 90% of low moderate income neighborhoods are black and brown. Let's take Baltimore. Did you know yet, did you know for the inner harbor, the billions of dollars spent in the inner harbor, the banks invested in that and it counted towards CRA. How in the hell did that help a black or brown body? How in the hell did that? No, it did. And we're put into the task, but the good news is because of this pandemic, there's some people, particularly with the income administration, but at the Federal Reserve Board, it says enough's enough. Because they know that doesn't help our country in the long term. So they're changing the rules. And this may not sound like it, uh, much, but for the first time in the history of the CRA, they're actually using the word minority, which doesn't sound like much, but it's a first step. So we're, we're having the head person in charge of the entire rules change for CRA. She's coming together with some black and brown leaders and actually one of them's from uh, uh, Baltimore, uh, Baltimore Community Lending Watch and Bruce. But we've, we've got, uh, we're gonna discuss what is needed to help truly economically help black uh, Latino communities. Another session is like 1071. Did you know that uh, 1071 of the Dodd-Frank Bill Act enacted 10 years ago, it mandates all banks to require small business lending by race and zip code, by race and zip code. But the banks fought it for 10 years. A group out of California sued the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and won three months ago. And so it now has to be enacted. So they've got a, every Bank of America, Wells Fargo, M&T, PNC, uh, SunTrust, BBT, they all now in Baltimore must report by race who they're giving small business loans. So why, that, why is that important? Because to me, you know, that's the, small business is the key to all this. It's that's a job creator, but it also creates wealth. Can you imagine now a thousand multimillionaire black business owners and the voice they will have and then the jobs they create and the home ownership that comes from this? So we're talking about that. And one of the other things, we're, uh, by the way, all the groups or banks are coming together with the Federal Reserve Board and they've got access to over seven hundred billion dollars of capital and resources investments, they're going to tell us at the summit and we're pushing them, how is that going to impact? And you must tell us what you're going to do for the black Latino community. And one of the people that I'm most proud, Brookings Institution, of, you know, one of the leading think tanks in the country, we've got Dr. Andrew Perry, a black economist, who's the leading, leading black economist in the nation. He's going to highlight and kick off the entire summit with why is it important for black Latinos to economically come together and how that would change America. So, but point being is that it, 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 it's what we're all doing and we join, we invite some of you on this phone, uh, you know, anyone on this call to join us in this economic march, because if we don't transfer this to results, economic results, we can't even address the social, you know, the, the underlying social uh, inequities in our country or the racism. I believe truly that we can address, begin to address systemic racism by uh, racism by first addressing the economics. And then from there, that leads to social power uh, because of the increased wealth that it creates for black and brown people. So uh, by the way, we are after the summit, we're launching 50 cities that will conduct the first CRA national blank hearings. And the five cities that are being launched and we're bringing in some of the best from the country to get all the banks and tell and put them on stand what, how they will impact economically and invest into the black Latino communities. Uh, the, the first five cities are going to be Detroit, Baltimore, Kansas City, Jacksonville, Florida, and Richmond, California. So we look forward to working with you know the black community in Baltimore. And really making, taking what we did at the uh, African American Museum, Councilman Stokes, and put it into action like so many of your speakers said, they want action. And the black and brown people come together, we can think about the voice we will create economically and even socially when we come together. 
so thank you for this uh, opportunity to speak, Cosmo Stokes, and, and kudos to, uh, to this bill. And it should be replicated in every city in the United States, followed up by what I'm hearing by actual resources and programs that uh, will uh, address it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Al. I appreciate you calling in and all the work you're doing all over the country. But I don't know if this panel have any questions real quick. Councilman Stokes, I do have one thing to say. Sure. Um, you know, to hear Al say that Black people are not contributing to GDP, and I get it, I understand what you're saying, but do we recognize that if it wasn't for this predominantly Black city and all the people who work here, that the county surrounding this black city would not have the wealth that it has. So that's an automatic value level for the people and the city. And so I definitely understand about products and services, but we're the ones who are funding people's great lives in the county. We need to be able to recognize our power base as a city because we know that our counties do not have the same institutional opportunities for employment. And so that's why everyone will work here, but they don't want to live here. They tear up our streets with their cars. And then people say, well, why are Baltimore streets so messed up? Because the people keep working here and leaving here and messing up our streets. So all of that is a part of it. That's once again, that is that whole system where we don't even recognize our own value to other people's lives. So that, you know, just thinking about that. I agree, Keisha, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, agree, I absolutely agree with you. And same thing holds true in, in other black and brown communities. We actually build the cities, but what, what we're talking about, we don't, we build them. And absolutely every major city in this country will not be what it is without black and brown labor, but yet we don't, we aren't participates, participants in the wealth of a city. And that's where, you know, this whole access to investment and capital. So, you know, if we help build the city, the black businesses and owners in Baltimore, they should own the hotels. They should be able to own the main business thoroughfares in that city, you know, and right now it doesn't happen. And so that's what we're trying to address is to take us from the laborers to the owners. Uh, thank you, Al. Thank you, Keisha. I'm going to do one more question to ask the panel. two minutes so we can wrap this up. And um, my last question, somebody mute yourself, please. My last question, do you have ideas on how to transform racism as you seek equality and economic dignity for itself or family or for the residents here in Baltimore City, especially the black residents? Councilman Stokes, I think dismantling of racism starts with the acknowledgement that it exists, which we're doing today, as we've had people to come to the table to acknowledge that they know it's alive and well in this century, and that they have put together some ideas about how they would like to participate in dismantling racism. I think one of the pressing question for me continues to be, how much power will you put behind the paperwork that you're going to generate to say you're invested in dismantling racism? Um, Keisha or Harold, you have a comment or a statement to the question? Um, Anytime I'm investing in the greatness of Black people, Black children, Black families, I'm disrupting systemic racism. And so that's my commitment. So whether that is using my networks to create opportunities for, you know, for students to get scholarships to college, whether it's creating opportunities for, you know, people to have livable wage um, and employment in which they're growing in and not just staying in a stuck position. I have to do the actions, the work that disrupt that. Um, and that's what I'm committed to. It's, it's more about the constant investment in the people that I serve and getting them also to understand their responsibility in helping those 
you know, around them. Because when you've been invested in, you must invest in others. I know that is why I work to the level that I do, because so many people have invested in Keisha LeVette Webster. You know, if it wasn't for my godmother right now, I wouldn't be able to pay my tuition to be in doctoral program. So I understand this, this constant need of investment in, in people who, who matter to you. Um, and so that's what it means for me. I'm just going to consistently keep investing in the, the, the community that I'm in. No matter where I am, I'm going to invest in others. Thank you. Earl, Mr. Madison. Yes, sir. Um, well, for me, am I not my brother's keeper? And if my brother's not able to keep himself, it is my evable right to join in to assist my brother. So I'm looking on all levels. I'm gathering more data. I'm looking at the process. But, you know, when Al spoke about one thing about the CRA and that they had a mandate, Why aren't they following the mandate? Why don't they think about those people who put their nickels to dime to build those large institutions and returning back that small portion? Because it's lack of access, the denial process. So we have to continue to elevate each other, hold arms together strong in unity, listen to what they have to say, but we have to come up with a plan. So we're in planning stages as the community. We're on the way up the hill. Some folks just have to understand they're going to have to get off the top of the hill when we get there. And we don't want to apply the same process to them and which was applied to us. Uh, um, thank you, Harold. And, and I, I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank my colleagues. I want to thank all the city agencies for being part of this. Um, um, conversation, I think, um, is good, but we got a long way to go. And before I, be, before I assess this, can somebody unmute yourself? I, 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 um, one thing, Councilman Stokes, I've been in the chat room, and there's a woman by the name of Leah Redman who's mm -hmm. been trying to be heard. So I would just okay. let you know. Sure, Sam, can you um, unmute uh, Nia Redman so she can speak also? Thank you, Nia, also. Hello. Neil? Ms. Redman? Ms. Redman? She may be having technical difficulties. Give her a moment, please. Sure. Sam, can you see if we can help her from off it, from your end and see if it's something you can do? Uh, it appears that she's logged in twice. She needs to close out one of the um, places where she's logged in at because that's providing feedback. Councilman, I'll try to send her a message. Hey Sam, Miss Redman says she gonna log out and, and go, come. She gonna do the. I guess she was trying to come on as a panelist, so she gonna call in, and that's where I thought she was. So she get ready to log out and just be on the uh, phone. Okay. While we're waiting for Nia, I have a question. Uh, I guess I'm just asking the other panelists, have they been able to identify agencies that may be a source of what they consider a constant problem when they're in need of funding or agencies that continue 
to seem not to respect their desire for um, capital gain. Well, you know, hey, Doris, bringing that, uh, I had one client come to me and talk about a fee. There's a service entity that we have here is a MeQ, for example. MeQ was charging a service fee of $6.82 additional to a client's bill that was not actually included in the bill. It wasn't a past due amount. So when it was questioned, they said to them, well, don't worry about $6.82, just pay it. So now we're in the process of saying to them, if you have 100,000 members and you're taking $6.82 a month from them clients, where is that money going? So the understanding is not in play. Financial literacy is a problem and it's systemic racism for the institutions as well as the customer. So if we began to look collectively and share across this media that we can collectively resolve these issues by having a voice as the citizens of Baltimore City, that we're no longer standing for these things. And we need to include those people to the table. Because I don't think they just want to take $600,000 every month to survive their businesses from the poor people who are under these disparities in Baltimore City. And real quick, her I'm going to cut you. Is Miss Brevin on yet? Miss Nia Redmond? I don't see. Hold on one second. See, I, I'm, I'm experiencing this is systemic racism. Oh, Miss Redmond, that's you? Okay. <laughs> Hello. Can can you all hear me? Yes, Miss Nia. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Well, I just like to share that I just experienced this technology glitch I've been experiencing, and I'm kind of pretty savvy now using Zoom. But from what I was experiencing, I was becoming very frustrated that I was experiencing once again systemic racism. Um, I deal with a lot of these Zoom calls, as we all are, and I notice when I'm dealing with certain institutions. In this town, I have these glitches in technology and not others. And um, Baltimore City government is one of them. Um, um, the things that Al was speaking about, and by the way, thank you very much for the presentation. I spoke to you, I believe, um, a year or two ago. Um, I was referencing people like um, Diane Bell McCoy um, from Associated Black Charities and um, Denise Joycey Jones. I think that was where I got a conversation about the work that Alpenia was doing, and I placed a call to him. But I would say this, um, everything I've heard um, has been great, and it certainly, um, it's almost like it gives me a feeling like, like I felt when Obama was elected. I felt it was a really feel-good moment, and that's how I feel about this conversation today, except for I do hope that we're able to um, accept the invite that Al offered for people to try to plug in, to network, to join a larger movement. Because from what I've experienced in Baltimore, and I know a, a, a lot of players in here, folks, a lot of players, is that for some reason, we have not been able to regain the same so sort of um, work together, love each other, move forward together that we were able to accomplish when the city was an industrial giant, when Bethlehem Steel was here, when General Motors was here, when those economic engines left, something left about our ability as black people to work together. We haven't had that. It's like that ended the same time the industrial uh, um, jobs left. And um, so I look forward to being activated upon by an outside force because I don't think that Baltimore can do it by themselves. All of us know each other. If you're doing anything worthwhile in Baltimore for a grassroots level, we know each other. Everybody knows everybody. So we evidently can't get it together on our own. And be that as it may, I'd like to understand the action plan beyond this conversation 
And I'd like to hopefully hear from somebody that's not the, the, the usual suspects. I have enjoyed hearing from Miss Keisha, breath of fresh air, just to hear the way you have explained what you're living on a day to day and how you try to take a break and, uh, you know, resuscitate and care for yourself. And care for yourself is very important, folks, in doing this kind of work intentionally. We have to care for ourselves, too, while we do this work. And I don't know the age of some of these participants, but I'll be 70 in a month or two. And we've been on this fight for a long time from a grassroots position. So I just like to know, what's the action plan? Where, where do we move next? El Pena, um, Liam Davis, um, some of you other white folks might be on this call, brown folks on this call, somebody I just don't know in my day-to-day -day work. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Ms. Redman. I, I just want to uh, um, let you know that we're going to recess this, but this is not just going to stop here. Um, I'm looking forward to all the city agents to report back and create a dashboard so we know exactly what they're doing, not just talking. And when you're talking, we need some resources attached to what you're doing because policies and systems, you can change them, but if we don't have access, Black people, to resources in this city like what with Doris and, and Harold, and, um, Ms. Webster and Nia doing with our young people and our seniors, if they don't have access, then it's just a whole lot of talk. And I can promise you, this hearing is not just gonna be a whole lot of talk, because I will be following up with all these agencies. Mr. Chair, you're you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm muted. Okay, I just want to thank everybody. Um, and I'm this is what Ms. Redmond said. I want to let her know this is not going to be just an, uh, a hearing and then they go away. First of all, we're going to recess. Second of all, I will in the community will be holding these uh, city agents um, accountable, not just off the policy, not off the, the system changes, but the funding source, because we don't seem to get access. We can talk about the, the, the reason why we not get access, but we want, I'm going to make sure as a council person that these organizations in the city and these agencies have access, because if we have money to pay the officers who, and we got good officers in the city, we got some bad ones too. So we got eight and ten, eight and ten million dollars to pay for some mistakes that the officers made in our budget, and we got money to make sure, especially black people and people that's really doing work in this city, have access access to resources also. So my closing remarks, my statement would be: Now, where do we go from here? This is the opportunity to work together by connecting solutions to what is determined to be the root of the root of the issue of racism. We just can't talk about it anymore, but begin to look at the authority as a city council to work closer with our citizens and not just hearing their concerns, but leveraging ways to resources and improve the quality of life for the truly underserved based on their skin color. Going forward, I look forward to seeing dashboards established to measure the work the partners are already doing. Being done, allocating resources, hold everyone accountable say that again hold everyone accountable for making positive change going forward thanks to my colleagues department departments and most of all the citizens for their testimony here today now what's next our work begins for a more positive outcome so i want to just again thank everybody and i'd like to recess this hearing because we will come back and call back the agencies to get their reports on what they're doing actually not just talking, but actually putting some policy, some changes, and some funding in place so we don't have to keep having this conversation because this is an old conversation. This probably been going on before all of us were born, 400 years of systemic racism, and it ain't going to change overnight. But if we hold myself, the city council, our state legislators, and our agency accountable, we can move forward and we'll see a better Baltimore and see black and brown people progressing in the city. So thank you for your time. I appreciate you. And this meeting will be, this hearing will be recessed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You.